Welcome to Undercurrent. I'm your host, Angela McDonald. The internet, it's something that we use almost every day. We take what we want, leave what we don't want. But for children, they might stumble across information that we don't want them to see. So internet safety, that's our first story for tonight. In the, talking about parents, what do you think their role? How can they protect their kids and, and, and secure safety while they using, while they go online? The best thing to do is, in my opinion, it's just education as often as you can. Sit down, speak with your kids. If they want to go on certain networks, sit down and discuss it with them, why they want to use them. If they are going to use them, sit down, get to know the settings, get to know how they work and build, build a, a, an environment with your kids so you can grow together in that environment and hopefully get them to understand how they work and more importantly to be using them appropriately and safely as well. If you want to, to if kids are, are listening to you now, how would you explain to them or educate them to be aware uh, when they can feel the danger, when they are talking online or when they are using the social media? The, the best thing I can suggest and how I educate my, my primary school and, and my senior kids is treat your real world, sorry, treat your online world with the same level of respect you would your, your real world. If you're approached by a stranger in the real world, naturally you feel cautious, you feel protective of yourself. But a lot of our kids aren't doing that online because it's a different environment. They might be sitting in their bedroom, so they feel more secure. So my biggest, biggest piece of advice is to treat your, your online world with the same level of respect that you do your real world. If you want to be more specific about giving their own informations, mm. about uploading their own photos, uh, how they can be careful about that, settings, playing with the privacy settings. Yes, yes. So, any of the, as I said, any of the networks they're using, get in, know the settings, how they work. But it's also assessing most of the social networking is in particular, they're so popular because of the information that we provide. This is how they make a lot of money for the information that we're pumping in, not only as kids, but as adults as well. So if, if we can always assess the information we're providing, and I'll give an example, something as simple as a photo of, of you in school uniform can tell me so much about you. Obviously where you go to school, because I can see your crest. I can tell your age, your gender, and obviously the environment where you're, where you're living as well. So it's important we just assess how much information we give. We can still take photos, we can still post them, but we assess how much information is within those photos that can minimise our exposure throughout the entire environment of the online world. If we want to get like to point tips for kids when they go online, uh, either social media or Google or any other website, what most, uh, what top ten tips? The, the top top tips for me would be simple stuff like never talk to strangers online. Always be aware of the information that you are sharing and assess your own information. Something as simple as checking your own footprint, your own online footprint regularly. And you can do that through Google. You can search your own name. You can even do what's called a reverse image search on Google. So you can grab one of your photos off your Facebook account, drag that, drop it into a Google search engine, and it'll show you whether or not that photo is anywhere else around on the internet. So. Little things like that, communicate with your parents, communicate with your educators if you are feeling concerned. Not so much for the predatory side of things as well, but cyberbullying. If kids are being picked on, it's important they speak to someone, or if they've seen someone being picked on, they should say something as well, because 73% of our kids won't say a thing to anyone. Uh, as internet uh, word, um have some danger on kids, it's the same for adults. Um, what do you think, how do you think adults should, uh, should go online and safely? Adults tend to take a, a lot more risk than our, than our kids, merely because of probably the environments they're working in, because kids are usually big into social networking and stuff like that, whereas adults, we're obviously into email now, we're banking, we're also working uh, eBay, Gumtree, so we're doing a lot more activity online. Again, it's just about being aware of the systems we're using. Simple stuff like, I mean, scams alone in this state are, are massive. So if we are using Gumtree as an example or eBay, it's important that we, we, we look into the legitimacy of the sale. Never transfer money directly into another person's bank account. 
make sure that we always use an escrow service such as PayPal. So at least we can be guarantee our funds aren't going to go directly to someone's bank account and it's, it's gone forever. So again, it's just about assessing and understanding the networks we're using. Google is a brilliant resource. So if, if you're unsure, if you feel suspicious about a scam, about being contacted by someone online, or you're not sure of a particular website, then just ask that question in Google. There's bound to be a forum, there's bound to be someone out there discussing it who may have had the same issues as you, or more importantly, may have fallen into a trap that you can avoid simply from just investigating online. All too often, the socially disadvantaged are marginalised, left alone and become isolated. There's a choir in Perth called the Spirit of the Streets. The doors are open to anyone and the sound that's coming from this choir is magical. I went along and watched one of their rehearsals. Well, um, people are just coming in uh, like we do every Tuesday and um, everybody just has a cup of tea, catches up with everybody about how their week has been and then at two o'clock we'll start off doing warm-ups and get into some singing. I trick people into singing. Yeah. Uh, I think that's what we do. We just uh, say, do a bit of this, do a bit of that, warm ups and things, and then, hey, suddenly you're singing and you didn't realise it. It's like climbing a little hill, and then when you get to the top, you see a bit further, you know, and I think they all go through that journey and, and when, when they all sing together, it's a, it's a very special thing because they, you know, they, it's the, the energy, the team spirit that kind of thing that makes it all work really well. I'm going to sing that again and people might want to join me. You can sing and I can sing, so let's all sing together. lessons at school and not all good so um, I guess uh, you just it's just giving people the opportunity to try to have a voice and to try in a non-threatening situation like it is here and it's because of the choir giving me that confidence and taking away that feeling of isolation and making me realise that the mental health issues were from working when I should really be winding down because of my age. And Bernard actually started the choir and um, I came along, I actually started coming in, I bought a young man who has autism and we were looking for an activity that he wanted to engage in and he just absolutely loves singing and we've been coming now for almost eight years and he has performed in front of hundreds of people probably thousands actually over the time that we've been running and just achieved so much and loves it he's made good friendships um, you know, and, and very connected, and yeah, and that's what it's all about for a lot of our people. You know, they come in, and whatever's going on in their lives, they join the choir, and it's like they make friends, they feel supported, and all of that stuff in their life just just melts away, and they find a new joy and confidence. It's easy, but there is freedom within. There is freedom without. Trying to catch the loot in a paper cup There are battles ahead Many battles are lost but you never see the end of the road While traveling with me
TV here, Rita, and uh, yeah, Rita, Rita, I got really into choir about two years ago. Do you love it, Rita? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> yeah. The company of each other and gain confidence from each other. Um, and I'm, I'm totally staggered that these people are prepared to get up in front of corporate audiences, any audience, and talk or introduce a song and talk about themselves. And I, I believe that's because they feel confident in the people behind them. We, we virtually take the word this had a disability, which is really bloody good. Tax cuts, everybody wants them. There's a new proposal on the table where low income earners can opt out of compulsory superannuation. We need to hit the streets to find out your opinion. Low income people earning less than $37,000 a year can choose to opt out from contributing to their superannuation fund. Today we asked the people of Perth about what they think about this. I suppose so, yes. Probably they need their income for other things really, for now. No, I think. I think we should definitely contribute to your super fund for the, the long term. Yeah, well I definitely think that they should have a choice over whether they get their super or whether it goes into a super fund. Because obviously if they're on a low income it's going to be hard to pay for things if half of it's going in towards super. Do you think that with an extra $60 weekly by not contributing to the fund, solve the problems faced by the low income group? No, I won't, but it will help. Yeah, that would be helpful. No, I don't reckon $60 isn't enough. Um, a week, you, you know, it's better that it's in super, definitely, because in the long run you'll be better off. Yeah, well I definitely think that would help them out, an extra $60 would definitely go really far. Do you think that this will be a problem for the group of people as they are unable to retire due to the lack of funds and will this create a burden for taxpayers in the future? Yes, probably, but they have to live in the now and get through now, so I imagine they'll think they'll, that their circumstances may change later. I don't know, it's so confusing. On one hand it's a good idea, on the other hand it's a bad idea. You can go either way with that. A problem for taxpayers? I don't see how it could make a problem for taxpayers. I don't think so. I don't think it will be a problem for anyone. It is their choice, entirely up to them. If they want to have savings and retire early, then that's up to them to save. People earning less than $37,000 are usually university students, the younger people. Do you think that by allowing them to pull out of contributing from their super fund will lead to more problems for them in the future? No, because I think they've got a lot of earning potential, long term. No, because as they get older and more experienced, they get higher paying jobs. I think they need to look at the big picture. Um, it's definitely a, it's a long term thing they want to have more fun, more fun while they're younger and not have to worry about their super and that is entirely up to them. There are a lot of people who will be a bit more responsible and they will think about their future a bit more and they will have the choice to put their money into the super but at the end of the day you should be given a choice. The people of Perth have a mixed feelings about whether people should be given a choice whether they want to contribute to their super funds. I'm Renida Azman reporting for Undercurrent. Stay with us on WTV. We'll be back after a short break for more Undercurrent. Welcome back to Undercurrent. It's no easy feat to write your own feature film. There's a new producer, writer, director, Jinder Singh, and he has written his own feature film and it's now in pre-production. Tibor caught up with Jinder and also cinematographer Simon Ackerman to find out about the new feature film for Western Australia called 11 Days. Here we are in beautiful Perth at Forest Chase and we got a special occasion here, an upcoming new film. 11 Days. And we're sitting here with Jinder and with Simon 
And uh, first of all, Jinda, tell us about the film and why you decided to make a super low budget feature film in WA. Hi, uh, Thibaut, thank you for having us. Um, well, this film is a fantastic story. It's a very simple story about a 12 year old boy on a quest to locate his brother within 11 days. So why you decided to make a film in here locally? Oh look, you know, I moved here about five years ago and this film came around around that time uh, in 2010 uh, um, and, uh, and Australia is so beautiful. There's so much to show uh, to the world about Australia. Western Australia uh, herself is such a varied and beautiful landscape. So this is a road movie, a journey movie. So the perfect place to do it is here, right here in Western Australia. So Jinda, we know you are a writer, director and producer of this movie. What's your background? Well, um, I've always been interested in, in filmmaking. Uh, back before I moved to Australia, I've done some short films back home in Malaysia. But when I moved here, the first thing I did was uh, enroll myself in the Film Institute in uh, Fremantle in FDI. And, uh, and since then I've done a couple of short films uh, and uh, in 2013 I believe for 2012 we built we did Shackles of the Batavia which was pretty well received by our local audience as well. So tell us something about the process of writing the script and the achievement of the script itself because we know that the project is fully scripted yes. and we got few key personals engaged for the project to support it. In 2010 uh, it was a project when I was in FTI to uh, it's a student project that we come up with our stories and this story is really personal uh, my dad passed away when I was uh, barely 15 and it's really symbolic of my life journey in 2011 when we made this short film called Antin Mardas it won a award in the Honolulu Film Festival so I flew to Honolulu, picked up the award. My first award was obviously pretty excited. Then from Honolulu, I flew to Los Angeles and spent three weeks with a script consultant. Yeah. And we had the beats of the story done and, and, and tightened the story and stuff like that. And uh, by 2014, the script, I had my first draft. And I put into several film, uh, script, uh, script writing competitions yeah. like Paige and Nichols and it, it went on to the semi-finals which took me by surprise really because it was my first uh, uh, foray guess. into a, a feature script. And from there I took the feedback, I rewrote it again and many drafts later we have won the best feature script for the, in the Silent uh, River Film Festival yep. and we won the uh, 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 River Scroll Award which was a phenomenal uh, experience. And then we won a, a, a silver prize in the Hollywood Screenplay Writing Contest uh, and uh, in the fe Family Feature Film ca category. Yes. And I would say a, the other highlight would be winning the uh, Best Feature Screenplay uh, for Family Film in the Nashville uh, Film Festival, which is an Oscar qualifier. So we know now that this script is working. It's working. It has legs. Are we preview to who is will play the main character, the main character, the boy? Yeah, the lead actor is a young 12-year-old boy. His name is Ajit Singh, and uh, he's going through drama coaching and all that. We are preparing him uh, towards the filming so that uh, he's ready for his role. And but he's also he will also be supported by other very experienced actors. Among others is uh, uh, Adam T. Perkins, who's really well known in WA and is a really professional actor. Um, and we have other actors from the East Coast as well who will be flying over to be part of this film because they've heard about the story and they've heard about um, how full of heart this story is going to be when it comes out. Thanks Jinda and wish you all the best for the film and lots of success. Thank you. Simon, uh, how do you get into that stage now you're doing a low budget feature film when you can do maybe huge budget films? It's not about the budget. It's about having a passion to, to make this happen. And you know what? There's great joy. And, you know, I, I often look at a script and I read the script and I say, I want to make this and I want to make this happen. And the passion that Jinder shows towards not only what the story is about and how the story is written, uh, but it gives us uh, a joy to want to make this, uh, regardless of the size of the budget. So, yeah, we're going to do our very best to, to make that look totally epic on the screen. Phones, tablets, you know, the digital age is taking over the picture making. 
So, Simon, what's your message for the young generation growing up now in here and start working in the industry? Yeah, look, it's one thing you can say is encourage them to do so, you know, and uh, whether you're using an iPhone or a, a, a GoPro or a, an Alexa, um, it's, it's how you frame the shot, it's how you tell the story. And this is where I keep going back to, you know, sometimes <clears throat> it, the story can be more important than the cinematography. Thank you, Simon, yeah. and wish all the best for the 11 days. Okay. It's Tibor reporting to Undercurrent from Forest Chase in a new film, 11 Days. When it comes to rare coins and banknotes with Australian currency, there's hobby collectors and then there are dealers who deal with millions of dollars for single coins or banknotes. This weekend is the Perth Money Expo and Belinda Downey from Coinworks started the expo. I spoke with Belinda about the historical value of Australian currency. I'm uh, president of the Australasian Numismatic Dealers Association. The association represents coin and banknote dealers throughout Australia and New Zealand. I married into a family that was specialist in this industry. And when you marry into a family like that from the day I think you marry, you become part of the family company and you become part of the industry. So yes, I've been in it for a long time. I particularly specialise in Australian. I've been asked many, many times would I extend beyond that, but I really believe that you stick to what you know and you stick to what you're good at. So we specialise in Australian rare coins and banknotes. Coinworks, we established that in, or I established that in the year 2000, um, I saw the need to establish a company that totally specialised in the product. I mean, the product is not cheap. Um, the product can be very, you know, very valuable, involve a lot of dollars. And I believe that as a dealer, we have a commitment to the buyer to ensure that the product is what it is, that the quality is the correct quality level that it, we say it is, the provenance. And so it really did become a full-time job rather than a subsection of a much larger company. I've sold a number of, um, really a full range of product. Holly Dollars um, and Dumps are Australia's very first coin and I've sold a number of those. Now most of your viewers would be aware that Australia has a very, very rare penny. That's the 1930 penny and I've, there's only three known in private hands and I've sold each of them. The first I think I sold for about 175000 in the 90s. Then in 2005, I sold another example of about 620000 And then about two years ago, two, three years ago, I sold one for over a million dollars. One of my greatest um, success stories was actually selling the number one banknote. It was the very first banknote of the Commonwealth of Australia. It had the serial number, number one on it. Um, quite an amazing piece of an Australiana and I sold that to a private collector in Melbourne. And admittedly, I sold it for $825,000. And the Australia, Australasian Numismatic Deals Association was actually established in 1995. And up until this year, until I took over, we used to call it the Ander Show, and, and no one really knew what Ander meant. So we've decided to rebrand, rename, and it will be now, we've registered the business name, it will be called Money Expo because it just has a broader appeal. And yes, there are more than 20 dealers going to be present, including, I'm very pleased to say, the Perth Mint are attending. But we're trying to encourage collectors, ordinary people to come along and see some of our currency treasures, or they may have treasures of their own stored away in a cupboard. And they've been dying to know what it's worth. We're charging just a, a, a gold coin donation entry, so you can get in for a dollar or two dollars, and the proceeds are going to ANDA, which is a, I consider a very worthwhile, uh, worthy cause. And people can then find out, bring the family along, find out if they do have value in what they've had stored away for years. About three months ago in the office, we had a gentleman come in. He actually had a holy dollar and he wanted to know what's it worth. And we, it was very, very well worn. The coin was worth 35 to 40,000. The holy dollar is Australia's very first coin. It was struck in 1813 under the instructions of Gov Governor Lachlan Macquarie. And it wasn't just, there's a story within a story, I think, which makes the holy dollar so interesting. Governor Macquarie didn't have metal discs. He imported 
40,000 coins. So they already had a design, they already had a date, they were made of silver. He imported the 40,000 coins. He enlisted the services of a forger to cut a hole in the holy dollar. He then had them overstamped and those two coins became the holy dollar and the little dump became the circular disc out of the middle. The Perth Money Expo is being held at the Domain Stadium in Subiaco. The opening hours are on Saturday, this Saturday, 10 a.m. in the morning till 5 p.m. at night. And then on the Sunday, the opening time is the same. It will close at 4 p.m. in the evening. Come on down for free valuations, hourly prizes and kids' activities, 27th and 28th of February at the Domain Stadium. During the mining boom, in the CBD, offices were pretty much at capacity. Nowadays though, after the mining boom, 70 to 80 per cent of offices are now vacant. And it's rising. Robin went to find out why. Amid the tumbling resources industry, Perth has seen a mass exodus from the corporate sector. Last year, Perth offices vacancy rate was 15 per cent. This year, it's 20. However, new offices are being freshly released to a market that doesn't want them anymore. For answers, I speak with Ian Edwards, Senior Leasing Director from Frank Knight. Now last year, the vacancy rate was around 15%. Now it's jumped to 20% as predicted. Why have we been seeing more office developments rolled out? Is this an error in foresight, or are groups pining for the eventual recovery of the property market? I think ultimately it was an error in foresight. Uh, those buildings were constructed during a boom period, and then circumstances changed. Last year your company tipped that the vacancy rate could rise to around 25% over the course of 2016. Now that we've hit the 20% milestone, are we still on track or is there anything to indicate that it might stabilise? I think we're seeing some stability come into the market now. Our predictions are showing a 21% peak vacancy rate, except if we see a lot of sublease space coming into the market. So if some major companies, for instance some of the oil companies, uh, start downsizing, we could see the vacancy rate go up another few percent above the 21% mark. Now these figures are the highest in 21 years. As severe as it is, should this really alarm investors or are these events simply riding the typical cycles of the economy? As, as bad as it sounds, uh, it, it's not as bad as the last time we were in this situation where the vacancy rate got to 32%. So uh, I don't think investors need to be particularly worried. Perth follows a, a commodity cycle and we're very dependent on global economy and places such as China. So it's just, it's just a normal cycle for Perth. Now with this level of oversupply and negative demand, this has become a tenant's market. What kind of incentives are there? Well, tenants, it is a tenant's market and tenants can ask for virtually whatever they want. They can get free fit-outs, they can get uh, low rent or discounted rent, or they can get a combination of those things. But generally, a, a tenant can get 45% of the rent handed back to them in one way or another, either as capital for a fit-out or as a discount. Some forecasts suggest that we won't see the vacancy rate decline below 15% until late 2018. When do you believe the property market will return in favour of the landlords? I think that 2016 is going to be a pretty rough year for landlords and then it's just going to steadily improve after that. If you call a landlord's market when the vacancy rate is under 10%, I think we've probably got another three or four or five years before we get to that stage. Poor planning and foresight has led to a dramatic oversupply of office space in Perth. While this is great news for tenants looking to snap up a deal, Landlords won't see the property market stabilise for another three to four years. I'm Robin Palmer, reporting for Undercurrent. You've been watching Undercurrent. Thanks for your company. Take care and we'll see you next week.